both Russia and China had the same starting point. Every aspect of the mission was pre-planned. The mission planning included all sorts of details. The aircraft was expected to reach a specific point at a specific altitude and speed, releasing the weapons in a specific se sequence, and so on. Every step was guided by a ground controller, and it required a specific verbal authorization from the ground. For example, in the 50s and the 60s, when overflying the Soviet Union was still possible for NATO reconnaissance assets, Soviet aircraft followed the Western aircraft only till the boundary of their area of competence, and then they invariably turned back even when there was no other aircraft ready to shadow the intruder. Why? Because that was the procedure. The Chinese kept flying in this way till the early 90s and even later. The Soviets, though, realized pretty soon that this way of flying was not really effective, and in the 70s they started a series of improvements like the Kavkaz program, the Exercise 500, and the creation of the training center at the Air Base 1521. But this is a story for another time. This partial change of attitude was supported by a concurrent technological development. The Soviets had had rudimentary data links since the late 50s. For example, the P-35 anti-ship missile could receive simple mid-course guidance instructions in flight from the launcher or from a Tupolev 95 aircraft flying within range. In the mid-60s, the first Soviet AWACS entered service, uh, the first being the Tupolev 126 MOS. The aircraft communications were mostly voice, but it started operating the first data links with the ground-based centers. Fast forward, the MiG-31 was designed since the beginning with the full capability of sharing the radar picture with all other aircraft flying in the same area and to download to other interceptors the fire solution. A MiG-31 could act as the quarterback of a group of less capable interceptors, like the MiG-23, for example, and this was a world first. Even today, modern Russian aircraft retain this capability. The commander of a flight of Su-30s or Su-35s can assign the targets to the other wingmen completely electronically and even control the wingmen's weapons. The 2126 MOS was replaced in the late 80s by the more capable Beriev A50 mainstay. Besides being a great improvement in detection range and sensitivity, the A50 featured a data link system comparable with the contemporary Western systems in performance. However, the relatively low signal processing capability limited the ability of the aircraft, in the early variants at least, to track more than 50 targets or guide more than 12 fighters. The current Russian variant, the A50U, currently used in Ukraine, definitely seems to be more capable in this respect. Another key element of the Russian information management lineup are the many variants of the Ilyushin 20 and Ilyushin 22 aircraft. Albeit not available in large numbers, these are the backbone of the VKS intelligence effort. There are flying common posts, alien aircraft, and electronic warfare variants. So, despite the fact that we don't have a clear picture of the Russian network-centric capabilities, it is clear that they have the problem well in focus and they have worked on it. The relatively low number of assets compared to US and China is partially compensated by the use of really advanced ground-based radars capable of spotting a target over the horizon, a technology where the Russians have invested a lot. It seems unlikely that they have the same level of interoperability and common capability as the US and NATO, but the war in Ukraine seems to have stimulated a rather important revision of methodologies and procedures.